One of the laws that Leonardo may have had in mind is that humans require animal protein and animal fat for optimal health. Optimal is the key word here. Humans are an amazingly adaptive species. If we weren't, we wouldn't have spread so far across the face of the earth under so many different conditions. But survival should not be confused with optimal health. There are such things as essential amino acids. These are amino acids that our bodies require but cannot manufacture, so they must be present in our diet. Animal protein is referred to as high quality or complete because it contains all of the essential amino acids in the proper amounts. There is no such thing as a complete plant protein. There are such things as essential fatty acids. Again, these are required by our bodies, but we cannot synthesize them. We can obtain these from plant as well as animal sources, but plant sources tend to be too high in omega-6. Diets containing too much omega-6 are thought to produce inflammation, and chronic inflammation is thought to contribute to chronic diseases, including coronary heart disease. Animal products have the optimal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. Despite the fact that there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate, the official guidelines suggest that 60% of our calories come from carbohydrates. And the American public has tried to follow these guidelines. Since 1977, when these dietary recommendations were first proposed by Senator McGovern's subcommittee, we've seen a decrease in red meat consumption, a decrease in total fat consumption, an increase in vegetable oil consumption, an increase in the consumption of grain products and sugars, including a relatively new product called high fructose corn syrup, and an increase in leisure activity. We were supposed to make these changes to reduce our risk of heart disease and to avoid obesity and related diseases like diabetes. So how's that been working? Since 1977, we've seen a significant increase in obesity, a significant increase in type 2 diabetes, no decrease in the rate of heart disease, significant increase in a relatively new condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Clearly, we have not seen the results that we were promised by the experts. We've all been unwitting subjects in a long observational study, the hypothesis of which is that a low-fat, high-carb diet will reduce obesity, diabetes, and the other so-called diseases of civilization. In my view, it hasn't worked out all that well. What a wonderful understatement. Remember when we called type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes? Every day, the U.S. government feeds more than 53 million people, many of whom are school children. Any government program must adhere to the official dietary guidelines. So here we have a healthy school lunch for elementary school children in Columbia, Missouri. It's healthy because it's low fat, but low fat diets are by definition high carbohydrate diets. And this amount of carbohydrate, the equivalent of two thirds of a cup of sugar, is more than the amount of carbohydrates contained in three and a half 12 ounce Pepsis. Is it any wonder that our children are contracting type two diabetes? Part of what makes all of this so very tragic is that when these guidelines were first proposed, the science warned that high carbohydrate, low fat diets could harm the American public. Going back 150 years, European and American physicians serving remote populations who were still eating their traditional diets observed the absence of diseases these physicians had been well taught to recognize. When sugar and white flour were introduced to these people's diets, these diseases appeared. The list of these diseases, which have been referred to as diseases of civilization or Western diseases, is remarkably similar to the list of diseases now thought to belong to what is referred to as metabolic syndrome. Conventional wisdom suggests that obesity increases one's risk of contracting these diseases, 
but science has demonstrated that obesity itself is a metabolic disorder. Obesity is a symptom of a disrupted metabolism, not a cause of disease. So what is the metabolic disruptor? What makes us fat? Science has shown us that it's the carbohydrates that make us sick and fat. This is a graphic representation of the 2005 dietary guidelines. They are revised every five years, so we're due for a new version. Unless some significant changes are made in the draft that was released earlier this year, they are going to suggest that we need to continue doing the same thing, only harder, with further reductions in dietary fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, and salt. These guidelines are the result of ideology, dogma, and politics, not science. In fact, the science shows that these guidelines are not appropriate for population-wide diet recommendations, especially in regard to restrictions on dietary fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, and salt. Science shows that reducing the recommended intake of sugars and starches will produce health benefits for many. The science shows that increasing the intake of animal protein above current guidelines would benefit many. The science shows these guidelines may in fact lead to an even further increased risk of weight gain, diabetes, and chronic diseases. Today, two out of three Americans are overweight. One out of three are obese. Today, one out of ten Americans has type 2 diabetes, and one out of five over the age of 65 have type 2 diabetes. Imagine if we could achieve this paradigm change. But we can only achieve this goal, however, if we have an understanding of diet, nutrition, and human health that is truly science-based. Imagine the impact on animal agriculture as a growing portion of the American public comes to realize that their diet should be based on animal fats and animal protein, not grain products. Think about the changes that could occur if public policy were truly based upon the available science instead of dogma, ideology, and politics. Imagine the impact on animal agriculture of a two- or three-fold increase in meat consumption by the American public. My way of eating is based upon that level of increase above the official recommendation for meat. Imagine the impact upon your business as an animal producer when the public understands that what you produce is, in the truest sense, health food.